Hi, this is Tim Santoni, and welcome to the Santoni Spotlight. Today, we're joined by Steve Smith. Steve, thanks so much for joining the show. Thanks for having me. You bet. Before we get started, maybe give the viewers a sense of your background, what you're doing now, and uh, so we have some context for the conversation. Okay. Uh, in 2008, I jumped off the 30-year consumer products train and opened my own coaching business, and uh, that's been going very well. Uh, it actually started out as a franchise. And uh, lo and behold, after about two and a half years, the franchise went bankrupt. So what do you do with a franchise when the mothership goes down? You know, you, you do it yourself. You do it yourself. And that's what I did. And it's worked really good ever since. Awesome, awesome. So the um, company now is Growth Source Coaching. That's right. And maybe give the viewers a sense of the, the typical clients you work with uh, or the ones you like to work with where you can kind of add the most value um, kind of in today's you know, business environment. Okay. For just about every client, and to date I've had a little over 400 that I've been privileged to work with, um, all of them have to come with a sense of, I want more, I want better. I don't know how to get there, but I'm willing to try. If they don't really have that desire, then, then what I do and what every other coach does isn't really going to work that well. Um, I like complex businesses, so I tend to gravitate towards uh, logistics companies, manufacturers, Companies with a lot of moving parts, usually multiple layers of, of people involved, because ultimately they all have the same problem. They've somewhere along the line they've drifted off the road. They're just not really focused. You know, they feel like they're out of control. Uh, some of their people aren't really following the game plan, and they're just trying to get their arms around it and figure out how to get in front of it and run it with confidence. Sure, sure. So. How is it that people, you know, give, give us some examples of how they might know they need a coach. Is it, is, it a, is it a board? Is it a CEO? Is it a manager? How do they recognize that, gosh, I'm not really doing what I need to do and, I'm, and they're comfortable with, hey, I, I need help. Like, give us some scenarios of how that plays out because I imagine there's a kind of a, that's a touchy thing. It is. And that's what I've learned over the years is you, it's very difficult to sell coaching to someone. Okay. They have to figure out. I have decided I no longer want to live with this mediocre, chaotic environment that I've, I've cultivated for myself. You know, I need help. Now I've got to go find out who's going to help me. And that's where the difficulty comes in. But most of the times what happens is, you know, after a couple of sessions, I'll ask somebody, okay, so who inspired you to take this, mm -hmm. you know, to make this jump? And I've gotten all kind of unusual answers. I've had people say, well, my spouse just told me that she can't live like this anymore, or he's not willing to, to stay in this. You've got to do something. So that kind of causes them to pull the trigger. Hmm. Other times, it's, um, it might be a, a trusted you know, employee that they bounce ideas off of that just says, look, you know, there's, there's ways to, to get people to help you from the outside. It usually has to be somebody from that inner circle, whether it's somebody in the company, somebody that's a... Uh, uh, a vendor that, that's considered a trusted advisor from outside the company, but typically that what that happens. Very few times I actually get people that just put their fist down and say, you know what, I'm going to do better. Next year is going to be great. I'm going to go out and find somebody to help me. That That's about a 10% proposition. Gotcha. So as you work with these people and you get involved and you're brought in to obviously turn things around um, on the professional and the business level, um, what are some ways that you build trust and, and, and gain rapport with these people as you're helping them go through, you know, difficult situations, right? Hey, they're getting pressure from their boss, the board, their wife, right. family, you know, what are some, some examples of how you, you go about doing that, that trust building? Okay, the, the very first thing I do is I let them know that what they're getting into is a journey. It's not something that after four sessions, everything's fixed. And you don't have just, the magic pill? I don't have magic oh. pills. I don't have silver bullets, <laughs> uh, all of that stuff. You know, I don't have any of that. And so, and I let them know that probably before they feel really confident about how they're running their business, how they're doing the job, it's probably going to be a little dicey. And that's only because when they start hitting those outer edges of their comfort zone, that's where most people start getting kind of the heebie-jeebies, you know, I don't know if I really want to do this. Uh, but after that, we spend all of our time getting into what that person wants and what they feel has been holding them back. 90% of people already know what the problems are. They've just never had anybody that's willing to listen and has been able to kind of help them either dodge it or get around it or find some way to overcome it because it's usually not going to go away. It's just their ability to recognize it coming and have a, a solution to deal with it. Sure, sure. 
So as you're working with them, obviously they're having to share your inner workings with the company. You mentioned companies with multiple layers. Maybe give us a, an example of a client you worked with recently where there were multiple layers. There's a little bit more complexity there and how you kind of dealt with helping them obviously interact with probably with management team, customers or clients, and, and their overall, um, you, know, inf you know, their overall world, if you will. Okay, I, and this was about a year ago, but I had a client that was in a, a university system. Okay, which is a little different than a business, but this was a, a for-profit university. Okay, okay. A fairly big one out there in the Inland Empire, and uh, he was a um, he was in charge of their technology system, which meant he was serving three groups in the campus: the students who needed access to you know digital resources, the staff who had all of their teaching materials on the system, and then the the admin, the hierarchy who who was kind of needing portals for various things, and. Um, he had a wholesale revolt on his hands. He had a lot of people working for him that, that just were disgruntled. They were all you know, technical in focus, so they weren't really that good with communications, and they were just getting dumped on by everybody. And uh, he came to me at one point, point. he says, you know what, he goes, if I don't find a way to fix this, they're gonna replace me. And I thought, ooh, that's, that's pretty direct. Pretty honest. And, yeah, and so we sat down, and we figured out exactly what kind of role he had and his people had, and did everybody understand how the team worked and what his role was in doing it. Instead of barking orders at people, figure out how to get to know them and help them do better at their job so they were more willing to operate as a team. And it took about 11 months and some real soul searching. He had to change a lot of his own perspectives about how he dealt with people. And once he started getting past that, within close to the end of that year, he went from being on the edge of his job to being served up for a VP slot. I mean, he made that much of a dramatic change, but it was his willingness to say, you know what, there's something I'm doing that's causing this problem, help me fix it. Sure, sure. So, you, say, you mentioned earlier, it's not a quick fix. There's an example, 11 months of pretty, pretty probably hard, you know, soul searching and hard work and probably right. not the most uh, sensitive, or a pretty sensitive situation. Um, when, you're, when you're working in those situations, and then you get to that point 11 months, do you typically stay involved? Do they move on? Like, how do you? How would you either help them as they move forward, or do you transition out? You know, how does that typically work? Um, every client I bring on, there's a minimum amount of time that they have to commit to. Because I've figured out over the years and the people that I've worked with that there's a there's kind of a transformational sweet spot, and it it goes from about five months to about eight months. That's about the time when people start to get it, and I can tell because when we have these weekly conversations. I'm not directing the agenda, they are. And when I see them start doing that, that tells me they now understand what's going on, they're taking full advantage of it, I'm now the resource that helps them, guide them in terms of the choices that they make. Um, but once they get past that, all of my agreements are, you stay as long as you need me. I don't work with everybody forever, okay? My job's not to be there forever. My job is to get off the plane once you figure out how to fly it. And, and so, but they make that call. That's great, that's great. So I think that we're kind of going through a ten transitional time as managers and businesses, right? We have a lot of different generations in the workplace. We have this, this kind of keyword millennials, people that are coming mm -hmm. up. Um, you know, maybe give us your take, you know, Steve's take on managing millennials and what that means to you and what that buzzword means or if it means anything to you. Um, as you're, you've gone through corporate work, consulting work yes. and coaching, you know, I'm sure you've heard that. So maybe give our viewers your take on millennials okay. and, and how to manage them, not manage them, or deal with that whole scenario that I think people are kind of, it's like a stereotype. Yes, well. and, and that millennial generation, I think, in some ways has got a little bit of a bad rap. They have contributed to that, but I don't know that they're responsible for everything people automatically assume about them based on when they were born. What I do know is that they're the most educated folks that enter the workplace of any generation we've ever had. Hmm. Many of them are starting at 29 and 30 years old with their first legitimate job, and they've already got a master's under their belt, okay? So they come highly educated. What they don't come with is a lot of confidence about how to operate in a professional organization. That's where their soft skills, that's kind of where they're, sure. they're a little insecure about things. But what I do know from the ones that I've worked with, most of them that are really sharp academically, they also understand that there's some things they're missing. So they're willing to learn if you're willing to, to be patient and, and teach and coach them in addition to holding them accountable for what you're paying them to do. And there's a lot of folks in established businesses that are you know, a little older 
that don't always have that level of patience or, or come into the relationship thinking, okay, oh my gosh, I got another one of these people. All right. Or the perception that because they don't have those soft skills that they're not equipped to do the job. Yes. And so they immediately yes. kind of label them or put them and say, oh, well, they're ignoring their, their true core skills. They're just, all they're taking is, is all their... And that's right. And sometimes I've actually coached people at higher levels who have been in organizations for a long time, but their team has turned over so much that the people that are now reporting to them are not the people that they were used to working with when they started. So now they're the ones that need the tune-up. The other people are there. They want to learn. They want to do well, but but they're getting a lot of resistance. Right. Right. So, so when you see when you get involved with a, with a, a company and, and executives or, or people you're coaching, what are like the top three things? I mean, I, I guess from my perspective, I think it comes down to kind of the communication and, and training overall. It's super important. But maybe give us the top three skill sets or or, or just overall competencies that you see that are lacking. Um, that you know, if you were going to write a book or you're going to do a course, those three things would be the core things you would do. Gotcha. Um, I think, and not necessarily in this order, but the three things that I run into most frequently are um, the owner or the senior executive has lost the ability to see forward. They're, they're so mired in whatever's going on in the moment, you know, dealing with people, dealing with competition, maybe dealing with P&Ls that don't look that good, that they're just, they're not looking forward anymore, you know? They got their head down, they're just like everybody else, they just happen to have more stripes. So getting them out of that muck and, and seeing a path to where they want to take the organization is a big one. Uh, the next one, as you mentioned, is communication. Um, over time, people tend to get the idea that I just need to bark orders and directives and other people need to fill in the gaps and get it done. And they lose the ability to interact with people they, their, their emotional intelligence score basically takes a drop. And so getting them to recognize that people aren't motivated by money. A lot of people think that, but people are motivated by different things. One is, do I have a purposeful job and am I being appreciated for coming in here 8, 10, 12 hours a day and doing it? So they need to be able to communicate differently. And the third one is uh, making good decisions. Um, you get into this kind of bubble mentality and sometimes you, you don't trust the people working for you. You don't feel like you have anybody you can just lay it out and not worry about how it's served up or how it sounds. And so you start making bad decisions because previous bad decisions are the basis for making new bad decisions. And they don't tend to learn over time. They just replicate those patterns. Right, right. The fear of making those decisions is uncomfortable and can the ramifications... And if they make a lot of bad decisions, then they stop making decisions, which is another which form is of bad decisions. decisions. Right. <laughs> right. Why well, are you not making decisions? Well, I made that decision before, so I'm just going to kick this down the road and right. hopefully it will... Sit on it, yes. <laughs> well, Steve, thanks so much for joining the show. Before we let you go, we like to ask some personal questions. So sure. when you're not coaching uh, you know, executives and business owners, what do you, how do you spend your free time? Well, uh, my wife and I do a lot of touring on our motorcycle, and uh, that's a lot of fun. That's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's my danger zone, even though we're pretty safe about it. Uh, so we like doing that. Um, we have three grandkids and one coming on the way, and so we've started going camping with them and doing things that we all grew up doing. So, uh, you know, and then we, uh, we like going out to, you know, going out to places like little local wineries with friends and stuff. So, like, so you know, we try to keep it light but real because you know I love what I do so I spend way too much time doing it my wife is a teacher and so she's completely mired in that so we you know we try to find long weekends to do those kind of things very cool um, and best book you've read in the last 12 months interesting um, I've read a lot of books over the years but the last 12 months I didn't spend any time reading other people's books I spent time writing my own very nice and so it's more of a uh, it's based on the Reader's Digest version it's kind of a pocket guide but it's on leadership axioms. It's 14 principles I've learned over life that if you, if you can figure out how to make them work for you, you'll do significantly better in those kind of roles. And so I've already published that one, and I'm working on a second one called Management Clout, which is how to show up in a, in a workplace and, and have people want to follow you and take your lead and, and look to you as somebody that that's really knows what they're doing. Very good, very good. So I assume we can, look, we can link up uh, a link to that book in the show notes. And Absolutely, yes. Great. Um, and, I, and I understand you also have a podcast. Do you maybe tell the viewers a little bit about that? Plug that here. Yes, um, I started this uh, in December with a colleague of mine named Will Robertson. And um, uh, this is actually my fourth in a, about a six-year period. But he and I made a really good pair of co-hosts. So we came up with the name Business Wingmen. 
because that's basically what we do. We sit on people's shoulders and we talk to them and help them figure out which way to go. And so it's a weekly podcast. It comes on uh, Fridays at 11 o'clock every morning. It's only about 20 minutes, so we get right into topics that business people need to, to, to learn about and hopefully do something with. So it's been a lot of fun. We've had a great time with it. Awesome. So we'll definitely link up all of Steve's contact information, a link to his book and the podcast in the show notes. And if you have any comments or questions, please leave them there. We'll make sure that Steve or I get back to you with uh, those answers. So thanks for coming on the show, Steve. We appreciate your time. Tim, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Yeah. A lot of fun. Mm-hmm.